Okay, it's now time to read God's Word. So if you've got a Bible with you or if you've got one at home, then grab it. And the reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Feel free to use the contents page. It's the letter of 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 15. And our reading is starting at verse 12. So chapter 15, verse 12 to 34. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, We are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you are and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God, say this to your shame. Hello everybody. There is genuine joy in my heart tonight, um, just coming to church, seeing people, just um, being able to chat to some of you just as we, as we began our time together this evening. Just, uh, it's so good to be here. Uh, really lovely to see you this evening. We will be back soon, meeting together properly I pray and hope, Um, but thank you for being here this evening. It's lovely to have you. We're carrying on in this little series in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We started last week um, with that particular event, thinking about did Jesus really rise from the dead? We're continuing on um, tonight and then into next week. Now, in an old um, survey from nearly 20 years ago or so, so the stats are probably worse now, actually, um, it was revealed that a third of Anglican clergy in the UK, don't believe in the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. A third. That is a third of Anglican churches, just like this one, up and down the country, where the resurrection is just being pushed to one side as not important or not true. And so you will hear bishops and vicars saying things like this. Okay, this is how one dean put it when asked, 
recently, last couple of years, he said this. He said, it's important for Christians to be set free from the idea that the resurrection was an extraordinary physical event which restored life to life, Jesus' original earthly body. The resurrection of Jesus, he says, ought not to be seen in physical terms, but as a new spiritual reality. Now, just carefully note what this guy is saying here, that the resurrection isn't a physical thing, that it's a spiritual idea more than anything. Now, that's not uncommon. And our question tonight then is this, does it matter? Does it, does it matter whether or not Jesus bodily rose from the dead? Does it matter whether or not there will be a bodily resurrection for all who trust in Christ? And I hope that you'll see this evening that it matters more than anything else in the world. That the whole reason I'm up here preaching is because of it. That the whole reason why it's worth keeping going as a Christian is because of it. The resurrection matters. Now, in the passage that Pete's just read, there's about nine sermons worth of material here. Um, We're going to try and pack it all into 30 minutes worth. Okay, so let's pray. Let's ask for God's help as we do that. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we do pray now, please, that as we come and as we consider your words, we ask that you might help us. Whatever our past week has looked like, whatever distractions we come with this evening, please help us to focus, to engage our hearts and minds, that you might do a work in us, that you might impress upon our hearts the importance of Jesus raised from the dead, and indeed our hope to come through faith in him. So please... Lead us now, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so last week we began then this mini-series in in, uh, chapter 15. And we saw, if you were with us or you watched online, Paul lay out the groundwork, reminding these guys in Corinth of the facts of the gospel. Namely, the historical eyewitness testimony of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It wasn't an illusion, it wasn't fake news, it really happened. And Paul went to great lengths to lay out this eyewitness evidence, particularly for the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Okay, we saw that there, in, particularly in 3 through 8 of chapter 15. There was just layers upon layers of, of remarkable evidence for this miracle. But now, in, in the middle here, Paul arrives at the main issue, um, because even though the gospel is preached, even though he's preaching the gospel, that Jesus has been raised bodily from the dead, there are some who are seeming to contradict that, because here's the Corinthian problem. All right, have a look at verse 12. If you've got your Bible open, verse 12, Paul writes this, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So some in this church are saying that there is no bodily resurrection from the dead. You know, it may have been they've been kind of influenced by the the typical Greek view of the day that life after death just means an immortal soul, a a kind of floating spirit in the clouds, nothing, nothing real and fleshy. You know, that's... Perhaps the kind of common view of the day, really. You know, when you die, you just kind of become this floating spirit. That was the the view back then. Whatever it is, though, Paul's logic is clear. Look, if Christ was raised from the dead, then the bodily resurrection of the dead must be a given. And indeed, verse 13, the logic follows. He says, look there, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. See what he's saying? Look, if if dead men don't rise, if it's all just a kind of spiritual thing, then Christ clearly didn't rise. And if Christ didn't rise, well, then you've got big problems. And so Paul's now going to go on and show the logical implications of if Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead. And all of this is going to go to show that the resurrection matters. Okay, so let's have a look. We've got a bit of a sandwich tonight. In verse 14 through 19... And in verse 29 through 32 at the end, Paul lists the the logical implications that hold if there is no bodily resurrection. So we're going to look at those bits first, and then we're going to go to the middle section in 20 through 28 to get the kind of doctrinal meat, and and then we'll land by drawing some implications for us today. Okay, that's where we're going. First up then, the resurrection matters because if Christ hasn't been raised, 
And Paul now gives us six logical implications of that in 14 through 19. We're just going to fly through these. If Christ hasn't been raised, he says, firstly, gospel preaching, useless. Verse 14. And he says, if Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless. Now, when Paul says that his preaching is useless, he's not kind of commenting on the quality of his sermons. Um, you know, it's not, not like a kind of, you know, it wasn't your best one today, Paul. He's not referring to that. It, he's saying that the content of the message that is preached is totally useless if Christ hasn't been raised. Because what's Paul preaching? Well, he's already told us. Verse 2, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Verse 11, this is what we preach. But Paul's saying, look, no resurrection of Jesus, no bodily resurrection, and it's all useless. The word useless means empty. It's, it's no substance. It's a sham. And the same goes today. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching, the content of what we preach from up here, is about as useful as a chocolate teapot. There's no point to it whatsoever. That's the first implication. Second, if Christ hasn't been raised, carrying on in verse 14, your faith is useless. Verse 14, and so is your faith. And verse 17 as well, in fact, if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. Because, of course, if the message preached is empty and useless, then so is the faith it produces. Your faith is a completely pointless exercise if Jesus is still dead in the tomb. We've likely all sat through meetings at work where um, everyone in the room knows it's a complete waste of time. Yeah, You know, that kind of feeling you're sat there thinking, why on earth am I being forced to sit here in this meeting through this Zoom call? You know, it's totally pointless me being here. If Jesus didn't rise bodily from the dead, then your faith, if you're a Christian, is just like that. Complete waste of time. Third implication. If Christ hasn't been raised, verse 15, the apostles are lying. Can you see what he says? More than that, Paul writes, we're then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he didn't raise him if, in fact, the dead aren't raised. That little phrase there at the beginning of the verse, we are then found to be, essentially means we're caught out. It's clear, isn't it? Either Christ rose from the dead or all the apostles lied. And that's important to remember. We said it last week. With the resurrection of Jesus, we're dealing with historical fact here. It either happened or it didn't happen. These guys, the apostles, they're either telling the truth or they're making it up and running the most elaborate hoax in the history of the world. There's more. Fourth implication. If Christ hasn't been raised, verse 17, then sins aren't paid for. Verse 17, and if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. We thought about this last week. If Jesus stays in the tomb, then there is no guarantee that the payment for sin is complete. A dead Jesus doesn't help anybody because how do I know the debt's been paid? A dead Jesus is a condemned Jesus, meaning I'm still in my sin. But only if Jesus is physically resurrected from the dead do I have assurance of sins forgiven. We cannot experience peace with God now if there is no resurrection because then we still remain in our sins. You see, this matters. Paul keeps going. More implications. If Christ hasn't been raised, if Christ hasn't been raised, verse 18, then there is no hope for those who've died. Can you see that? He writes, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. This is the tragedy. They've perished. It's the end. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then, then those who've died as followers of Jesus, you know, they thought they were falling asleep in Christ, but their luck's run out. That's it. Game over. All that stuff that was kind of said around the graveyard about the hope of heaven, it's just fluffy nonsense. It's hopeless. And final implication, if Christ hasn't been raised of this little bit, verse 19, then Christians are to be pitied. If there is no resurrection of Jesus from the dead, then Christians are completely deluded. I mean, it's an utter tragedy. If this world is all there is, if Jesus didn't rise bodily from the dead, then the Christian is a martyr to an illusion, as somebody once put it. A guy called Paul Gardner, writing on this verse, puts it like this. He says, it is utterly pitiable to think of believing in Christ only for this life, since all believers have is a dead Christ. And that's fair enough. If Jesus is still dead in the tomb, then people have got every right to look on us gathered here and think we're absolutely mad. You see Paul's flow of logic? 
just line after line, unpacking the implications of if Jesus wasn't physically raised from the dead. It matters. It matters. And then just jump over to verse 29, because Paul actually continues this train of thought there. Okay, we'll just see a few more implications here. Because if Christ hasn't been raised, and as such, if there is no bodily resurrection from the dead for all who follow him, we'll think about that in a moment, then here are another three implications. First up, he says, baptism for the dead, in verse 29, is pointless. Now, I know what you're thinking. Baptism for the dead is a waste of time. Um, Look at the verse. Let's try and work it out. He says, now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Um, it's, it's tricky to understand quite what's, me, what's meant here, given that kind of we're not given any context into what's being practiced here in Corinth. I guess first thing to say, this isn't Paul commending the practice of baptism for the dead. Um, you might call it vicarious baptism. That's where living Christians are baptized on behalf of Christians who died without getting baptized. Sort of thing that still goes on today. Um, uh, the Mormons practice that sort of thing. Paul's not commending it. Okay, He's commenting on it. The entire teaching of the Bible clearly leaves no room for anybody uh, to be saved you know, by somebody else being baptized for them. Salvation is by grace through faith. But this practice, for whatever reason, is clearly going on in Corinth. And whilst Paul here does seek to disassociate himself from it, can you see how he writes, what will those do? In other words, not me. Now isn't the time for him to go into detail on why it's not good practice, because he's talking here about the resurrection, not their faulty baptismal practice. But Paul is using their kind of dodgy approach to make a point about the resurrection. And so Paul's saying this, look, there is a bodily resurrection. And I know that you know that there is, because why would you otherwise be getting baptized for dead people? Baptism is all to do with being symbolic of new life and resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then your practice is pointless. Next implication. If there is no bodily resurrection from the dead, verse 30 and 32, we are suffering persecution for nothing. Have a look at what Paul writes, verse 30. And as for us, he says, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? You can read a long list of the sort of stuff that Paul goes through in 2 Corinthians. We looked at it last year. Stoning, flogging, shipwrecks, all sorts he experienced. When he says fought wild beasts, it's a kind of metaphor for that. And Paul's saying, look, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then what have I gained by putting myself through all that trouble? It would be pointless to live in such a risky way that death might happen if there was no resurrection ahead. Surely you would do everything to maximize your comfort and safety now. And so the alternative and final implication, therefore, is this. If there is no bodily resurrection from the dead... Lastly, we may as well party while we can. End of 32, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So Paul's conclusion is this, quoting from Isaiah 22, a suffering, Christ-following life would be so totally pointless if there was no resurrection that a different approach to life would be far better. You may as well... Just get all you can with whoever you can, wherever you can, whenever you can. Eat, drink, and be merry. And actually, if we think about it, that's the kind of prevailing cultural wind, isn't it? You know, there is no God. There is no heaven or hell. There's just this life. So we may as well live it up while we can. There was a singer called Peggy Lee from the late 60s, and she captures it perfectly. She sings this in one of her songs. She sings, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is. And she's right, isn't she? If this is all there is, if there is no resurrection from the dead, if death is just the end of it, then come on, let's just stop church right now, break out the booze and have a ball. We might as well. You get Paul's point. I hope it's clear. The resurrection matters. It matters more than anything. You you cannot be indifferent to it. You cannot think that it was merely spiritual and that it doesn't change anything. The vicars and the bishops who are saying that kind of rubbish need to read this chapter again. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then I'm out of here. But 
Verse 20. But verse 20. Here is one of the, the, the great affirmations of faith in the entire Bible. Verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's clear that Paul has no doubt at all. Jesus really is alive. That's what we thought about last week. He has been raised. The verb is perfect tense. It means that not only has Christ been raised on a certain day in history, but he continues permanently in his character as the risen Lord. But it doesn't just start and end with Jesus. You see that? He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does that mean? The first fruits, they were the kind of first sheaf of the harvest. They were brought to the temple and waved around. It consecrated the whole of the harvest. You can read about it more in, in Leviticus 23. They were a visible sign, these first fruits, that, that the entire harvest was about to begin. It's captured in the word, isn't it? First fruits, it implies later fruits. It's a bit like my dad's fruit trees. Um, when we stay at his farm over the summer, there's always a day when you spot the kind of the first plums ripened. And at that point, you know that a glut is on its way and you're going to be picking and eating plums like there's no tomorrow in the weeks to come. And so here, Christ is the first fruit of one who has been raised from the dead to permanent life. And don't miss that little phrase there at the end of verse 20, just as an aside, of those who have fallen asleep. Paul uses that phrase quite a bit to describe dying for the Christian. It's beautiful, really, isn't it? This is death for the Christian. We should fear it no more than we do putting our head on the pillow at night. Because in the blink of an eye, there is going to come a day when that body is going to get a wake-up call. So that is the central point that Paul makes. There are countless implications If Christ wasn't raised, if there is no physical resurrection from the dead, but but Jesus was and there is. End of discussion. Actually, it's not the end of discussion. Paul's got more to say on this. Um, Two things to flesh out in more detail. Okay, this is the kind of filling of the sandwich, so to speak. That in Christ, all will be made alive, and that through Christ, death will be destroyed. Let's just look at those briefly in turn. Firstly, in Christ, 21 through 23, All will be made alive. Let's read it together. Verse 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Okay, so here's Paul reminding us of the origins of sin and death. Verse 21. Death came through a man, and again in verse 22, as in Adam all die. This is the the doctrine of original sin, that that sin and death comes through that first man, Adam, and that Adam's sin had far-reaching consequences. He functions as the the representative, as the federal head of the entire human race. Okay, It's not that you and I start out as kind of morally neutral when we're born, and then we learn how to sin. We are by very nature sinners from birth through being in Adam. Adam functions as the the representative then of the whole human race. That which he did, we did with him. Now look, Paul unpacks that a whole lot more in Romans 5. He's not going to go into detail on that here, and so neither will we, because his point is this, that in the same way in which death came to everyone through a man, so the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, the God-man Jesus. Just as in Adam, everyone is scarred by sin, and so death is the outcome, so in Christ, all will be made alive. Now clearly, the the all, in verse 22, of Adam and the all of Christ are different. Okay, All people everywhere in the whole of human history belong to Adam, but clearly not all people belong to Christ. This isn't Paul teaching universalism in verse 22, that everyone will be saved, Actually, clearly, the all who belong to Christ, verse 23, it helps us, doesn't it? When he comes, those who belong to him. 
So just as in Adam, everybody dies because of their sin, so everybody who belongs to Christ, all who are in him, united to him by faith, will be made alive. And that's not figurative, that is literal bodily resurrection, just as he was. Maybe this um, illustration will help. Um, I love taking my kids and standing on the kind of rickety metal bridge that goes across the main train line from Rains Park to Wimbledon. All right, you know, there's a bunch of bridges on that line. And standing on one of those bridges, and we stand there and we watch the trains just kind of shoot underneath us. And sometimes the driver will give us a wave or a toot on the horn or something like that, which is fun. Um, I think I enjoy it more than my kids, actually. Uh, Now, imagine that train, okay, coming from Rains Park through into Wimbledon Station, if you know what I mean. The front bit where the driver is, I think I'm right, that's the engine, okay? That's what's pulling the whole thing along. Right? That's the first bit of the train to come into the station. But all of the carriages, because they are coupled to the, to the engine, as me and my kids watch from the bridge, we know that they're all going to make it into the station too. It's not that one of the carriages decides to kind of jump off and go a different route. I don't know, if the carriage is attached to the engine and the engine pulls into the station, then the carriage is going to make it into the station. It's not that complicated. That's kind of what's going on here. In Adam, we are all attached to the train carriage that is heading to death, life without God forever. And in and of ourselves, there is nothing we can do to stop it. Adam is the engine, if you like. But when we put our faith in Christ, we couple ourselves, or or rather God couples us, to a new train. And now we're heading to resurrection life. And friends, Jesus has already come into the station. He has risen from the dead. He is alive now in heaven. And because we are coupled to him... So we will too. And nothing, nothing is going to stop that from happening. And these are the two options for all humanity. We are either in Adam, coupled to that train, slaves to our sin, which only ends in death and the judgment of God, or we are in Christ, coupled to him, and on the way to resurrected life in paradise. That's what Paul's getting at here. In Christ, Through faith in him, all will, emphatic, will be made alive. Now, more on just what that looks like next week. But Paul's not done yet. He's on a roll, unpacking more of what awaits. Because secondly, through Christ, death will be destroyed. Have a look at verse 24. He writes, then the end will come. When he, Jesus, the Son, hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Okay, so when the dead are raised, that is the end point in history as we know it. That's the point at which Jesus has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Jesus wins, in other words. He reigns. And indeed, as the risen ruler, he must reign. Verse 25, for he must reign, Paul writes, until he has put all his enemies under his feet. 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Don't miss just how awesome this verse is. The promise that death is going to be destroyed. Again, the tense of the verb, to be destroyed there, it suggests that the action has begun, it began at the resurrection of Christ, and that it will be finished at the final resurrection of all Christ's followers. Now, just remember where we started, okay, back in verse 12. Remember, you've got these guys in Corinth saying, there's not going to be a resurrection. Paul's saying, look, you've got totally the wrong end of the stick. It's not that there's going to be no resurrection. There's going to be no death. We live in a world where, at the moment at least, where we feel like we're, we're trying to beat, we're trying to defeat death, and yet we, we just can't. And so we desperately produce vaccines to try and delay it. We pour billions into research and development to try and slow the aging process. Jeff Bezos, one of the richest men on the planet, has invested a fortune in a cryogenics company to try to come up with the technology to freeze his body before he dies so that he can be defrosted when the right medicine comes around to revive him. People will try everything to try and beat death. But you, you look at that desperate attempt from Bezos and think, what are you doing, man? Somebody's already done it. Jesus, and only Jesus, has the power and authority to defeat death once and for all. His resurrection from the dead proves it. And so there will come a day 
when death will be gone forever. And then Paul comes to his crescendo with this in verse 27. 27, he writes, for he has put everything under his feet. He's quoting from Psalm 8. Jesus, the fulfillment of that psalm. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Here's the kind of climax of the whole thing. And let's just pause just briefly just to examine verse 28 in particular in a bit more detail. What's going on here? Um, Because on the surface it sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? In what way is the son subjected to the father? You know, does kind of Paul think that the kind of father is somehow superior to the son? Like what does that mean for how we think about the Trinity, about the deity of the son, those sorts of things? There have been endless debates on this sort of thing in recent times, particularly around the issue of whether the son is eternally in a relationship of submission to the father. But I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here. It's important to see that that Paul isn't talking about the essential nature of the son or the father, but rather about the work achieved as the father sent the son to do, as we've been thinking about in John in the daytimes, if you've been with us for that. Okay, the father sends the son to accomplish the work of defeating sin and death and winning a people for himself, and the son willingly accomplishes it and presents it to the father with the main purpose that the triune God, end of verse 28, might be all in all. And this is the goal of it all, that everything may truly be subjected to God for God's great glory. And so the end result really is simply that God reigns supreme. Now if you switched off in that a little bit, just come back, because here's the main point of this little section. The resurrection proves that the end of history is this, God wins. And those who are united to Christ will win along with him. I mean, it's a pretty staggering picture that Paul paints in these eight verses, isn't it? Jesus really did rise from the dead. Because of that, we can be sure that all who are in him will rise bodily when he returns and that he will defeat death once and for all, and he will reign forever. And so, yes, a thousand times, yes, the resurrection matters. Now, as we we just start to come into land, let's let's just draw some implications for us from all of this, everything we've seen. And in fact, to do that, I think we can just reverse Paul's logic that we looked at to begin with. Do you remember his implications if the resurrection isn't true? Well, given that it is that Jesus has been raised, that we will be made alive with him, that death will be defeated, what follows? Well, firstly, it means that gospel preaching is essential. Preaching and proclaiming that Jesus came as king, died for sin, rose to rule, will return to judge is not an optional extra. It is everything. It is not useless. It is the whole point. That's why the preaching of the word of God is the, is the focal point of our gatherings together. Secondly, it means that faith is vital. The bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the assurance that your faith is not in vain, but is totally necessary for salvation. Thirdly, it means that what the apostles say is true. It means we can and should trust what has been written down by them in the pages of the Bible. It means we want to listen and pay attention to what they have to say as faithful eyewitnesses to the truth of the risen Jesus. Fourthly, it means, that, it means that sins are dealt with. We thought about it last week. Yeah, the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead is God stamping paid in full right across history. And that means that I can go about my day tomorrow with joy in my heart, knowing that my sin has been totally dealt with, that there's no more payment to be made, that my chains are gone. Hallelujah, because Jesus is risen. And my sin is washed away. It means that there is certain hope for those who've fallen asleep. Death is no longer the the end of the road, but it is the doorway to life with God forever in paradise. 
Those who have fallen asleep trusting in Christ, and maybe you have loved ones who have done recently, they are not lost. They are found in the arms of their loving Heavenly Father and their living Savior. Next, it means that it is unbelievers who are most to be pitied. Do you remember the train illustration? Yeah, you've either got your wagon hitched to Adam, leading to death, or to Christ, leading to resurrection life. It is, it is those who are hitched to Adam who are to be pitied above all. And by the way, this kind of passage should absolutely motivate us for evangelism, shouldn't it? The resurrection of Jesus and the life for all who belong to him should make us look out on a lost city with pity and stoke the fire in our hearts to go and tell with urgency. There's more. I told you this could have been nine sermons. It means that, it means that baptism, not baptism for the dead, but certainly baptism, is inherently valuable. It's a visible sign of what has and what will happen to the follower of Jesus. We will be raised to life. And just on that, by the way, if you've if you, um, been coming along to the Dundonald Church and you haven't been baptized yet and you're a follower of Jesus, can I encourage you to speak to me or one of the pastors about it. Uh, when we're in the new building, we've got a baptistry pool at the front of the new building, and one of the first things I'd love for us to do is just to have a big celebratory baptism service, giving thanks to God for new life in Christ and proclaiming the hope of the resurrection. Um, so get in touch with me, please. If, you, if you're a follower of Jesus and you've not yet been baptized. Let's book a date for that in um, soon, later this year. Here's another implication. Because Jesus really did rise from the dead, because we will rise with him, it means that suffering isn't pointless, and it means that gospel risk is worth it. Stephen Um, he's an author, he puts it brilliantly. He writes of how Christians do not need to engage in self-preservation and self-protection because they cannot ultimately lose. It's precisely the line of Jim Elliot. If you've known me for a while, you know that this guy is one of my missionary heroes. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the guarantee of the life to come led him to say, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he gave up all chance of worldly success to go and reach the Orca Indians in Ecuador with the gospel, and he ended up losing his life in the process when just in his late 20s. Friends, the certainty of the resurrection to come, it frees us to live riskily for the sake of the gospel. Now, that might be going to reach the unreached in the middle of the jungle, like Jim Elliot, or it might be giving up a well-paid career to go into full-time gospel ministry, like I know some of you, even in this room, are considering doing, or it might mean starting an evangelistic Bible study at work, even though you know you're going to get flack for it, or having that difficult conversation with unbelieving family members. The resurrection to come means that gospel risk is totally worth it. And finally, it means that life is not about living it up in the here and now. Okay, life, life now isn't just one big hedonistic party as at the end of verse 32, living for ourselves. No, it's about a call to be godly, to live a holy life with Jesus as Lord. And that's where Paul lands in 33 and 34, which on the surface feel a bit funny that they've come here. But I think it makes sense when read in the context, because here's the implication for these guys in Corinth who attempted to be led astray by this dodgy teaching that there is no resurrection. Paul says, look, come back to your senses and stop sinning. 33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you are and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Come back to your senses. It's literally sober up from the party. Stop sinning. The whole chapter, it looks like Paul's considering this doctrinal question on the resurrection. But right doctrine leads to right living. Okay, holding tightly to a, a right understanding of the resurrection gives us the grounds for wanting to live a godly life with Jesus as Lord as we look ahead to the wonderful banquet to come. All of which to say, and I hope you got this now, I've said it enough times, holding to a robust doctrine of the resurrection, it matters. That Jesus really did rise from the dead, that we through faith in him will be made alive, and that he will defeat death once and for all. Now, our lingering question that we may be left with 
is this. What's the resurrection going to look like? We're going to land with that next week. Okay, so come back for that. But until then, let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we give you praise and thanks that it's true that Jesus Christ really did rise bodily from the dead and that gives us the confident assurance of all those wonderful things that sin has been paid for, that we through faith in him will be made alive and we look forward with great hope to the day when death will be defeated once and for all and we will be with Christ our King in paradise for eternity. How we long for that day And until then, help us to keep going as people of the risen Jesus, with our eyes fixed on him, proclaiming that glorious news to a world in need. And we ask this, that many might look in and see him as king and lord and turn to him for salvation, that our faith would be strengthened and that Christ would be magnified. And we pray in his name. Amen.